Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast, your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I heard that. You heard my watch? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flottam. And I'm Jim, too. I'm the visitor here. We're in your garage. Uh, it's not a garage, it's a sophisticated high tech shop with uh, a lot of things in storage here. Oh, my apologies. That is correct. Now that I'm looking around. <laughs> yeah, this is a colorful place. This is why we do it on a podcast instead of letting you see video here. And just like the, the video and the Kim and Jim show, it's raining outside. Yeah, we can't work without rain. I, I'm honored <laughs> to be a part of that. <laughs> Jim and uh, and Jeff and I are sitting here in Jim's garage studio shop 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 yeah uh, and <clears throat> one of the things that happened uh, this weekend was Warwick Kerr passed and uh, I know Jim has a lot of history with Africanized honeybees and Warwick Warwick Kerr was the beginning of that story and I know some of it but I know that Jim knows a lot more of it so I'm just gonna Tell us what you can recall about how all of the Africanized honeybee story started. Well, I got to tell you, I really appreciate you wheezing, weasel wording that. Tell us what you can recall. <laughs> this was all a long time ago, and I, I was a young man. So this is not science. This is not history. This is three of us discussing what I remember happening. And this is as I recall. Dr. Kerr was interested and upgrading uh, South American bees to be more like U European bees. So they were more manageable, more docile, more friendly, more everything. And for, for one of those things he was working with was to go back and bring original stock from various places in Africa. I remember ta Tanzania, Tanzania, Tanzania. And there were difficulties shipping. They came from other places too. Apparently, in one of the countries involved, they sat in customs for quite a while, and some of them began to die. It was quite an episode getting them. So instead of going back and selecting bees again, apparently, gossip, rumor, innuendo, instead, the second time around, they were much more pushed for time, and they took what bees and queens they could. Now, if I'm offending anyone, I don't mean to. This was this is rumor. This is uh, old story hearsay. But anyway, they ended up with bees on the African continent in Brazil to do this test work with. And in the Brazilian countryside, apparently, as they worked with these bees, they prospered. They were happy there. Uh, some escapes occurred. Well, why wouldn't that happen? So once the escapes begin to occur... Then they were out in the countryside, in the jungle, and they began to trek all directions, but primarily northward, since that was our direction. That was <laughs> the one we were concerned about. But they did go other ways, too, apparently. And these things were notorious from the get-go, which brings up discussion possibilities here. Well, were, they, were these bees the only hot <laughs> bees that came over, or have we selected bees all down through the centuries that calmed our bees down because it really looks like that those African bees and then this testiness where we call some Africanized bees, scientists always had an opinion on that one way or another. This, this hot bee nature, was that strictly these bees or was that just because we had calmed our bees down many, many, many years ago? You guessed for a while, Kim. Well, one of the things, uh, go back to, go back to uh, Kerr, uh, initially, one of the things that I recall was that uh, they had brought our European bees down to the tropics in Brazil, right. and they were not at all successful. Right. Ex they remember, were yeah. they were used to um, seasons, and yeah. and not not dry and wet seasons, but cold and warm seasons, and they just weren't being successful there at all. And his trip to Africa, his initial trip to Africa, was to find a a, a bee that was adapted to the tropics and the tropic seasons that they were having in Brazil. And uh, the first, as you said, the first, the first shot didn't work for whatever reason. And the second shot, they were, they got in a hurry, didn't, the selection process wasn't as, as thorough. And they ended up with bees that definitely were adapted to the tropics, but were also um, much more defensive. So that's that got us. That gets us to Brazil, and they're moving north. And then um, 
I know that I know that uh, USDA was involved, started getting involved with studying them to some degree, and was sending people. Didn't they? Weren't they sending people down there? Yes, to Venezuela, the a village or a town named Acarigua. I don't remember how I got there. You would fly into the main city there and take buses and whatever and ride for hours and go to this kind of remote village, and that's where the USDA had set up a, a, a research lab there. Was this, this about the early 80s? It would have been, yeah, 80s, 81 to 82. Mm-hmm. Now, listeners, we all said that, you know, this was not a history. This is a conversational discussion about what <laughs> happened as we remember it. So and, and we're, we're gonna, not writing history books here. And we're going to leave some things out and maybe remember things that didn't didn't uh, happen the way we think. Uh, before you, Even before USDA got involved, though, if I recall, Chip Taylor from Kansas yeah. was down there with some of his grad students. And uh, some of his grad students got... Got their degrees under fire, I think, by studying those. Yeah. I know Mark Winston was part of there. Good uh, one. Um, what's her name? The, who went to the USDA eventually? Anita Collins. And Anita, Anita Collins was, and there were others that mm-hmm. were down there, and they were there initially, and then USDA came in behind them, if I recall. That is correct. Yep. So, Dr. Taylor started, who's now still, to my knowledge, a monarch butterfly. He's, he's even science. retired from the, that. Quite the deal. He's retired from that yep. too. What's his retirement thing? Um, he's he's still doing monarch stuff, but he's retired from the university, as I understand. He did it. the initial work. Yeah, You're right. And then the USDA, after he laid the foundation for it and got the policy going, and it was clear these things were going to be an issue, it became had more funding from ARS to deal with it. Yep. Well, they got to they got up to. Uh, uh, the tip of or the top of South America, and they were entering Central America. And then, then I knew that, I, if I recall, the USDA got really involved. And there was a project at uh, what was that 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 narrow spot that the USDA was looking at? You know, I called that name just a bit ago, and now I'm blank. It'll come back to me. The Isthmus of Tehuantepec. There you go. That narrow, <laughs> narrow part, right in Central America, where it almost thins down to nothing. They were. It was some kind of last stand, Alamo-esque, where we'll make our <laughs> final stand here to keep these things out. And while we were standing, apparently now we're chuckling. A lot of people put their careers in this. Man, I find it so funny. But while everybody was getting ready to put the bulwarks in place, uh, they began to find Africanized swarms well beyond. Yep. I was always taught to say they were Africanized because they had interbred with bees that we had had a hand in there, and they weren't truly, at that point, the bees from Africa. Other scientists and geneticists argue that, in fact, they had rebred themselves back to the original stock, and they were African bees then. Probably in some minds that's resolved. Probably in some minds is not resolved. Probably in most minds no one cares anymore. But I refer to Africanized bees now, all these years later, as a bee that might have been hybridized with more docile bees. And when I refer to African bees, they were the direct stock from Africa. I think one of the things that, uh, if, if I recall, Chip was telling me about this very thing. And uh, as they moved into an area that had European bees already established, there was some initial crossbreeding. But because of the behavior of the, the African bees... Their swarming tendencies, um, flooding drone congregation areas with way more drones, and their uh, uh, earlier in the season mating, the behaviors of them sort of isolated them uh, pretty much. Once they moved into an area, they they initially crossed, but then uh, I, I went back and became pretty reverted. much reverted. Yeah, reverted back, and it was a behavior thing, pretty more than anything, if I recall. I'm saying that again uh, carefully, if I recall, because uh, I we I just learned this uh, Saturday, and I've been on the road since uh, until I sat down here in Jim's shop <laughs> today, and I haven't had a whole lot of time to look this up, but we wanted to get it out while it was still fresh. So, once they got to where you got involved, when they got to Venezuela, <clears throat> there was groups of people, industry be industry leaders in the country who felt like that. The beekeeping public and the public in general was not prepared for what was going to happen. 
when these things invaded because we really didn't know. Where they had been coming through, they were just taking no prisoners. They were fire and brimstone. These were hot, ugly bees. So after the Isthmus of Tehuantepec didn't work and they were just given free reign to move on up and through, Venezuela at the time was an agreeable country to letting the USDA, ARS, and APHIS work there to try to understand what these bees were, what their behavior was, what could be done, what did they respond to, and so that was the operations for research before they actually came into Brownsville, Texas, and McAllen, Texas, all those years later, that Southern uh, Bee Research Center there. So in Venezuela, I went there, I don't know, six, seven, eight times. Uh, I, I, I had to learn. I'm just Jim Two Bee guy. I had no special anything, but it was shocking all those years ago, to be around these bees for the first time. I mean, these were nutcase bees. <laughs> they were just idiots. You wore those Daydat helmets with the vents in the side. I think you can still buy them. And those bees, if they couldn't sting you back when I had hair, they would pull a strand of hair through that <laughs> vent. And so you'd have 30 bees on each side pulling 30 strands of hair. And they had kind of an electrical feeling about it. <laughs> and and the bees were so loud and so many bees swarming you had to shout at each other and they'd crash into your veil ever and try to take a picture doing that uh, yeah i was going to talk to you about that in a bit <laughs> i do have photos but they would hit your veil so hard they would flick small drops of venom on your face and mm. when you took off your veil it looked like you had a mild case of, of the measles mm. with these little spots on your face so i came right back to ohio with photos that I will talk to you about. It's adventuresome to use a film camera to photograph these animals and gave these presentations, and I just had audiences suicidal. So I, I had to learn to, to calm it down, you know, to even though I was, I was in shock, if you're going to be the speaker, the speaker shouldn't be in shock. <laughs> so after some time, I grew, and others did too, to realize you don't lie, but you just leave the audience with copious amounts of hope. And there was hope. And as it worked out, the hope was successful. But at the time, no one knew. So Venezuela is where all that work happened. I was on the sitting there by myself. My job was to monitor something. I was in the middle of nowhere, and I spoke about 12 words competently in Spanish, and most of that involved restrooms and ordering beer. <laughs> and there you sat in a lawn chair all afternoon, and there was suddenly all this bee activity around me out of nowhere. I mean, it's just wide open Llanos Plains. You can just see forever sugarcane fields being burned off. And I've got all these bees around me. So I packed up my little chair and said, say, want out of all these millions of acres, they want this spot. I'm just going to move away some. So I moved away a few yards and sat there and there the bees were. Moved again, there the bees were. And I realized that when I put on a queen's uh, attractive pheromone that morning, I had contaminated the brim of my hat and that those bees were responding to that queen pheromone. And anywhere I went, the swarm that was in the area was coming for me. <laughs> well, I had this image, you know, these bees are going to kill you. They're going to kill you. Why would I need a bee veil? I didn't have a bee veil out there. I'm in the middle of this open plain monitoring uh, bee flight activity with a balloon and a queen up there. So I decided I better get out of there it's because they were clustered on my cap. I left the cap on the ground and I ran to a sugarcane field that was nearby. Yeah. And then I thought, well, this would be clever to hide in the sugarcane and be bitten by a poisonous snake while you're running from the bees. So it was quite an afternoon. They finally did a small swarm, about a pound, cluster on my hat. I got photos. <laughs> and then when I came... Everything had died down, and the ARS people thought I was suffering from sunstroke or something out there, but they did come around that I was attacked by a friendly bunch of Africanized bees that just were responding. But I got to tell you, at the moment, it was not funny. You two are chuckling now, but at the time, I thought, how far can I run? I don't have a veil. I had a plastic bag, and this is true. I thought I could put that plastic bag over my head and hold it back for you, cat. You can't have any part of a plastic bag over your head and run anywhere, so check that out. All right, I've wasted too much of the <coughs> podcast would, time. That would have been terrifying. I mean, especially if you'd already had the experience. I had already me. seen what they could do, yeah. and then I'm sitting there totally unprotected. 
But it worked out well. You know, the bees were sometimes were just bees. And at other times they were, like I said, they were crazy bees. We had Dewey Karen uh, recently on a podcast, and he was talking his time in Bolivia, his family there uh, are beekeepers. And he was telling the, the story of how uh, even today, uh, in the spring, they're nice. As they build up in the summer, they're nice. And when their population gets big in the summer and late summer, you don't want to be there and, and you don't want to be there at all. So even today, that that behavior has mellowed some, but not a whole lot. You know, it's always quirky. They'd be hot sometimes, some parts of the season, just like Dr. Karen said. Other times of the year, they would be much more relaxed, laid back. Uh, I don't know. You know, we said a bit ago that Dr. Taylor said that they they, they reverted to their original stock. Well, I, I don't know. I'm not arguing with Dr. Taylor in any way or anybody else, but I don't know what happened, that the bees are somewhat amenable now. I can't speak for Mexico, but I never hear anything about the bees going crazy there. I think they moved bees away from populated areas, but, you know, those Africanized bees completely encircle both of the two largest amusement parks in the country, both of the Disney worlds in yep. California and the one in Florida, and there are special troopers that come in and remove these bees and make a vast amount of money doing it. The <clears throat> beekeepers in Mexico, um, the, the, a, a lot, a great deal of beekeeping in Mexico is down in the southern part of the country and where, uh, where they do a lot of their uh, vegetable growing. And the beekeepers there will tell you that, yes, we have uh, the bees here are hard to work, but they're incredibly productive. Right. Uh, they produce a lot of honey. And they are good pollinators, and they're willing to put up with the behaviors that uh, they see down there because they're growing a lot of produce, and we're buying a lot of produce from them. And and where they are, it's organic because it's jungle. Um, so they're producing a lot of organic honey down there, and and we're bringing a lot of that up here too. Don't they also uh, requeen if they get too aggressive? I mean, they the certain threshold they start getting too feisty though. And and. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't. I'm, I don't know that, but because people aren't dying by the score down there, I'm guessing that there's some sort of behavior modification going on, and that that would be the mm-hmm. obvious one. And I was wondering also early on, uh, they were talking about as the Africanized bees worked their way north in the United States, the the temperature and the average temperature and everything would make them more docile. Is that what they're finding today? Is that is that part of the limitation? I mean, because they're not up in Washington State where I'm at, unless they come up on a truck. But they're not migrating there on their own. Be patient. <laughs> well, you know, some, some, well, they're, they've slowed down. What's slowing them? They down? have. You know, they sat near Houston, Texas, for a, a decade and a half, yeah. just to the right, waiting to go toward Mississippi and Louisiana, which they finally made some move, but it was half-hearted because nothing's happened. But something is changing them. So mm-hmm. either either they're not <clears throat> always reverting, or they've had to change their attitude to survive. And and they are <clears throat> excuse me they are overwhelmingly outnumbered by uh, the European bees population in this country, uh, which has lent itself to that too. But don't tell that to the guy with a bulldozer in Georgia who turned over a pile of lumber and yeah. died because of it. Mm. Uh, it still happens. Can we get off the subject and stay on the subject? That still happens, though, even now. And I went through an experience that I put in bee culture about a colony that was completely unreasonable, a swarm that moved in, stung my neighbor. He's right across the way here, a nice guy. He thought it was yellow jackets. And you, you stand there and you think, you know, when do you tell some of the truth but not all the <laughs> truth? Because too early in the season... To have yellow jackets attacking you, so I had to tell him it was my bees. So I want to rush this a bit. All right, I got to take this colony out. Well, which colony? I mean, they're all flying, coming and going, coming and going, but yet I got bees all around me here. Who's sending these bees to attack me when I've done absolutely nothing? I finally, after a process of elimination, selected that one swarm colony and moved it out way out, uh, 40 miles from here. And there it sat in its punitive state in Tuscarawas County, Ohio's version of the boonies. 
and a bear found it. Oh, <laughs> and scattered bees and equipment all over the place. And that was rare. It's one of the first bears in Tuscarawas County in a hundred years. <laughs> So I had to go down and clean the mess up, and I found under a box about two pounds of bees, all wet and forgiven. They were still feisty, but they're defeated. I stacked the equipment back together, almost no brood that I knew of, and very little food, no pollen, wet, moldy, soggy, ugly, and I thought, well, you're done for. And then my friend who owns the place just made a casual discussion last night that your bees are really flying quite nicely out of that hive again. So when do you say that aggressivity has a strong survival connectivity. We've known for a long time that the more aggressive bees are about stinging you, the more aggressive they are about bringing in a honey crop, too. <coughs> so a, this confuses uh, the issue when you say these are bad bees because they're aggressive, but if you're a bee in the wild and you're dealing with humans, their biggest pest, I think it's probably to their survival advantage to be pretty ugly about it. The, the saying, the saying <coughs> excuse me, the saying has always been it takes mean bees to make a lot of honey. And uh, the, the counter to that is that's because you've got, a, you've got a colony of bees that's adapted to the local area and they know their, they know their pests, just as you said, people being probably their biggest one. So if somebody walks by, the last time somebody walked by, they took all my honey. It ain't going to happen again. Mm -hmm. So... Well, you were you were uh, uh, an employee of the USDA for a while. Uh, I think you said half time uh, working with this issue with, with, with extension. With I, extension, I was to develop information, which you know even now we're rambling and putting in weasel words and qualifying. It was no better then because you wanted to tell the truth, but what was the truth? It was still being developed. So my job was to give talks. Everywhere, uh, I traveled to, it's possible to finally get tired of it after nine years, 10 years, I guess it was, but I traveled everywhere and talked, primary topic was Africanized bees for the extension service, the federal level out of Washington. So you were who were you talking to when you were doing that? Okay, anybody, county groups, uh, sometimes there was societal groups, governmental groups, local agencies, all, all down through Arizona. There'd be workshops. There'd be train-the-trainer sessions for regulatory people in New Mexico. And you're supposed to have this information show up, what to do. Soapy water concoctions and working with Paul mm -hmm. Jackson in Texas to develop soapy water mixes and making videos of all this stuff. And, you know, you just drove the propaganda machine. That's what, <clears throat> Dr. Eric Erickson, who I worked with at uh, the University of Wisconsin in Madison at the USDA Bee Lab there, uh, moved from Wisconsin to Madison during that time, or maybe just a little bit after that. And uh, he started working with local fire departments on how to deal with what he called honeybee emergencies. But the, the as you call it, the weasel word here is because there are Africanized bees here, a honeybee emergency is going to be a real emergency and training fire departments how to deal with those. And uh, he and I put our heads together and and uh, we put together a video up here in Ohio to t train <laughs> northern beekeepers how to do that, or not beekeepers, northern firefighters how to do that, how to deal with with. Uh, car truck accidents with bees, uh, car accidents, kids, whatever, swarms. Um, while I was working with Eric down there, um, learning the skills that one had to learn to teach fire departments, he had a bee yard 30 miles from nowhere that had an eight-foot electric fence around it. I think it was electric. It was big anyway. And he had un un undocile African bees in that bee yard. And I, I got to do the camera thing that you were just talking mm. about. Um, and, and he had water there and they had the desert to forage in. And I was there 20 minutes, maybe a half an hour. And I, I'm not going back there. <laughs> <laughs> it was so hot. You know, those bees would thrive under those hot conditions and you had to be fully suited. You had to have a roll and a half of duct tape somewhere on your body. <laughs> and you were just drenched wet inside, just soaked. It was, you couldn't drink. 
I mean, you couldn't, how are you going to open the veil up to take a drink because you got crazy bees everywhere? Now, today they have the hydro packs, like the, a lot of yeah. runners. and. My daughter wears everything. one of those things. I'm not familiar with them. I've never used them. but In my day, when I was a runner, you just had to wait for the water table to come <laughs> <Okay>. up. <laughs> there was no hydro pack. What a I, bunch I of baby know. runners. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> No, let's not go down that. We get a lot of people, a lot of hate mail. We don't need hate mail. No, no yeah. hate mail, Jeff. No hate mail. <laughs> We're just kidding. I, yeah. I would wear hydropacks now in a heartbeat. It seems like it'd be kind of heavy to start, though, wouldn't it? If you got a quart and a half of water on you, two quarts. I'm yeah, gonna... but it's better. The The theory is, and the practice is, the hydration is outweighs the, okay. the weight. So, because uh, you'll cramp up and everything else if you don't well, hydrate with the electrolytes and everything else. Welcome to Beekeeping Today and Running Podcast. You're right. <laughs> Since I know even less about hydro packs, let's talk about them for a while. <laughs> well, I can change the subject again, Jeff. We just said you just mentioned mail, and if people have questions, what do they do? Well, they can. Uh, let me get back here. So, there's a couple ways you can do this. Uh, the website you can leave comments. If you're also on Facebook, the way the website works, you need to have a Facebook login. But you can also send questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com, and uh, that'll get routed to us, and we will have uh, a response. So we'll go to, if you have a question here for uh, Jim, then we can um, uh, direct it to Jim, and Jim can uh, either write a reply or will he record a reply? We have one coming up from... Um, Tom Theobald from a couple, yeah. couple yeah. episodes ago, and someone uh, wrote in some questions, and he has a reply, and we're going to record it here in the next week and get it on a future podcast. So, so if you got some questions about today or any of the podcasts on Beekeeping Today podcast, um, go to the webpage or or uh, send us an email, and we will uh, get back to you. So, Jim, back to back to your work with Extension. That lasted how long? Did that last, and, and was that a full time job? No, it was a half-time job. Ohio State cooperated with the Extension Service in D.C. with USDA Extension. And I basically, I lived here in Ohio, right where I am now at Audit, the Ohio Agricultural Research and Development Center of the Ohio State University. Only a bureaucrat could come up with that name. And I never left home. So, I mean, I never left home for the job. But once or twice, you'd go over to D.C. and sit in meetings and whatever and I was always around ARS. They were, I was, I guess, a thorn in their side because I needed word, word, word so I could submit it. And they were, they didn't want to say anything as they shouldn't if they couldn't peer review it, second guess it, laboratory it. So I had a, it was always, what can I say? What can I say? You know, I need a fact sheet. I need a news deal. Oh, I, I need to tell you about that. They trained me. That was sent me to charm school. Media, media school? <laughs> That's where it comes from. <laughs> ah, so you're at a meeting and you step out in the hallway and somebody snaps on all those lights and starts that camera and says, so how many people are going to die from these killer bees? And they told me to say, whoa, that's a great question, but I'm just leaving this meeting and I've got to go right to the men's room. Can you hold that till I get back? And then you decide in the men's room if you want to go back or not. <laughs> I'm not being funny. There's news people listening. <laughs> I understand that. But you wanted to be right. You wanted to tell it as it was, and you didn't want to be caught off guard. So that that did help a lot. That did help a lot. Well, you, they didn't teach you any tricks. They just taught you to maintain your wit, not your wit, your... Key messages. Your uh, attitude, your... Composure. Composure would work. Still not the word I want. Demeanor may be what I'm looking for. And don't, don't suddenly go stumble-worded. Don't look off access. Don't look like, you know, you're a convicted criminal at the scene. Uh, Deer in the headlights. Good thing. camera contact. Get it over with. And say just enough to don't ramble. Don't get friendly. Don't become familiar. Answer the question and go. It was good training in life. I don't use it. I should, otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> wait, but, wait, wait, what? <laughs> But it, that part was helpful, and it was totally different. And if other people in there who had nothing to do with bees, we were all looking and being trained. And the media was always amused that we had to have training to talk to them. And, well, then you spent some quality time with that deer in the headlight look you referred to on the front page of a local paper. Anyway, that came and went. 
I don't know what I really gleaned from that now, but that was a major part of what went on. We did videos, uh, just trying to prepare, not just the public, but the agencies too, that this was going to be unusual beekeeping. But you know, we don't have enough time, because all the time that was going on, you think that was encouraging people to come to beekeeping? Do you think anybody in the world wanted an Africanized beekeeper right next door to them? And so it was a really a bleak time in beekeeping. Could it get any worse? Oh, sure, sure. Because we were being introduced to Varroa and to tracheomite before that yeah. at the same time. And so while the public knew everything about how bad these Africanized bees were, they did not realize that we were just being taken to the woodshed about these other two types of mites. It was a it was a bleak time in beekeeping. Well, yeah. Ace, also at that same time, he had all the the public. Um, I don't want to say media, but but the public image with the movie The Swarm and all yeah. the other negative, yeah. um, the negative movies and the culture was not positive for the honeybee. It took years for the public to recover, and they did it slowly. And then the latest episode of CCD or the name it, I think, is going by now, Colony Collapse Disorder, seemed to cement and galvanize the fact that that Africanized bee era had passed, and we were now more entering into an area where, wow, there's no bees left, and pollination, and then the whole thing took off, and here we are having this podcast. So this is a historical note on... Uh, the appreciation that modern-day beekeepers should have for beekeepers who stood by their guns and kept on keeping bees when so many people were deeply concerned about lawsuits and massive envenomation. And, and the cities were passing ordinances. Ordinances everywhere. Well, part of the, part of the, at the same time, part of the uh, information that we were getting was that there is going to be a line in the sand that those bees wouldn't pass north of because of our winters, and, and that kind of insulated and ensured us up here that, well, I'm sorry about you folks down there, but we're going to be okay up mm -hmm. here because we have winter and these bees aren't equipped. So part of, part of our uh, attitude was shaped by that, um, and it took a long time for them to, to decide that they were going to come north of that line. They definitely are north now. They're uh, what, Northern California, Oklahoma, uh, yeah. into, into Georgia. Yeah. So, so, um, well, this thing affected the Canadians too. They, they didn't want those bees there from Southern Packaging Queen producers. So it was a difficult time where people were drawing this line you talked about. And that's very true that anything south of this line, we don't want in Ohio or Michigan, and we certainly don't want it in Ontario. So Package and Queen producers were, under siege. Well, you mentioned tracheomites, and and mm -hmm. uh, that's when tracheomites first really hit the uh, the southern U.S. and Canada shut off package uh, uh, buying packages from the southern U.S. and suddenly there were a whole bunch of queen producers and package producers, both in Southern California and all across the South, that it lost their biggest customer. Right. And that changed their behavior a whole lot. Overnight. Um, overnight. Overnight. Exactly. Overnight. I was on a bus. I want to I want to say it was 1987. I was on a bus going from a honey producers meeting to the bee lab at Baton Rouge. And there were two queen producers on the, the bus. And I had no, no people didn't know me from Adam at the time because I just started. And I happened to mention to the person I was sitting next to that I was the editor of Bee Culture Magazine, and both of those queen producers came over that seat and said, we need to talk to you, because suddenly they had to start advertising their product in, to U.S. customers because their Canadian customers were gone. Uh, hmm. The California people weren't worried about Africanized. They didn't think they'd ever get there, but they were having the tracheomite, and the people in Texas and parts uh, east and west of there were looking at both of those issues as being detriments to their product. Hmm. I need a disclaimer for the Canadians. You had to be there. We didn't know what the answer was going to be. We didn't know how bad these bees were going to be. We didn't know how they were going to survive winters. We didn't know a lot of things. So what some of the more northern U.S. states did, what the Canadians had to do was, at the time, a very painful but the best option that they saw. So I, in retrospect, 
didn't hold it against them. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I've, I'm from Alabama, and we were a package and queen producing state at one time. But I would have been careful about ordering bees from the south to put in Ohio colonies and then have open hive day here with those kinds of bees. It was a, I got to tell you now, before we say there were good people and bad people, there were a bunch of confused people. That's probably better than whatever more science the case. that we had yep. of the day. Uh, well, you, did, you did the best you could do in the middle of chaos. It was pretty interesting. I remember in the three day Ohio, the beekeeping course we had, I mm-hmm. can't remember, I came down to, to the, the lab and, and we did a dissecting with the dissecting labs and or dissecting microscopes and everything and oh. the tracheal mites. And um, that was pretty scary seeing all the seeing the, the creepy crawlies. I mean, the, I shouldn't say yeah, creepy crawlies, but the but the the tracheal mites crawling around in the in trachea, and it's just like wow. And and when you see them crawling, and you think that's impressive. I mean, it really brought home the the, the well, reality of the yeah. situation. As bad as Varroa was, at least you could <laughs> see them. <laughs> yeah. To to find tracheal mites, you had to kill the bee, yeah. take dissect out that large. Prothoracic trachea. Oh, they're not here. Well, you put it all back together and apologize to the bee. <laughs> Throw it back. <laughs> and when you finish that, go put all the toothpaste back in a tube. So it, that was at least you can see varroa as bad as they are. And you can see the direct effects. But trachea, I guess, I don't look for them. Do you look for trachea mites? Uh, but, but the, what I'm told is pretty much all of the bees that were susceptible to trachea are pretty much gone. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen signs of them. I have. I don't look. Yeah, last time I took a bee apart. No, I haven't taken a bee apart in a long time. If I could find a dissector microscope, and I've thought about it occasionally, because every once in a while on Craigslist or eBay or something like that, you see mm-hmm. something. And, one yeah. of the things that one of the things that Be happened fun. during that time, um, when when even before they got to the U.S., but after they were established in the southern U.S., was uh, some of the queen and package producers. Uh, down there went out of business or closed closed shop because they just didn't want to contend with this anymore uh, and close, stopped selling packages in Queens and just settled on making honey. But some of them continued to make packages and sell Queens and advertise in our magazine, in both magazines, the American Bee Journal and ours. And I have a basket full of hate mail that I have saved um, that that from people who said, how dare you send killer bees all over the U.S.? And and I'm quitting my subscription. You you obviously don't care about the safety of people in this country, and you obviously are out there only doing this for money. And there was, I don't know. I talked to Joe Graham about it one time, and he said he got some of that too. I don't know how much, but we got quite a bit for a short period of time. What a story, Kim. I've never I've never thought about that kind of heat, but you'd be exactly right. You're advertising. You're promoting. Yep. yep. You're a dispersal agent. <laughs> <laughs> And you're doing it for money. And then that was, that was, I got 40 of those letters a day for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I had never considered that. All right, I'll put you on my sympathy list for what happened years ago. <laughs> you and Joe both. Yep. <laughs> well, it's all calmed down now. Yep. And we don't know why. I don't know why. I, 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 I got to change the subject drastically for a moment. And, yep. and I was at a Mother Earth News Fair this weekend and I listened to a, a, a the long, uh, the long hive uh, person. His name is Leo, and I want to say Sharshankian, and I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing it right. But his talk was uh, products from the beehive, and he's from Russia, and he had a product from the beehive I have never heard of before. Jeff, you're never going to need this. You and I should try it. What they do is they harvest combs when they're done, and they they set them out to become infected with wax moth, and they are heavily infested with wax moth, and then they go in once. Once the cocoon, once the worms have all uh, spun their cocoons, and and they collect the, the the webbing that's on the frame, and they harvest the frass, the 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 wax worm moth poop um, from from the webbing, and they gather it all, and then they soak it in vodka, big big clumps of it, dinner plate sized clumps of it, and they soak it in vodka, and applied to your scalp, it is supposed to promote hair growth. <laughs> is that what's on your head? <laughs> Thank you for clearing that up. You people should see what Kim has on his head right now. 
I've never heard such a story in my life. I, have, I, I had to I had to share that because I have never heard in forty years in bees. I've never I didn't heard want to that. offend the Canadians. I don't want to offend the Russians. But <laughs> whose idea was that? <laughs> I, I had to. I mean, he talked about comb honey and chunk honey and, yeah. and crystallized honey and, and creamed honey and all these things. But this one I had never heard of before, and I just, I, I, I'm going to have to set out some combs this yeah. this week and see if I can harvest some of that. And 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 it's got to be uh, vodka. You couldn't use mineral spirits or something. <laughs> I don't know. Snake yeah. oil comes to mind, but I'm not to cast aspersions. Yeah. It just uh, maybe it works. I've rambled around a lot. I do want to say this about this Africanized bee thing. It was a it was a rough, uncertain time, and right decisions were made and incorrect decisions were made. But it passed, <clears throat> and I am so happy that I'm a little bit productive and still involved in bees and, and able to be a part of this beekeeping generation now that has no comparison. I don't know of anywhere in the world, any time in history, that beekeeping has been this explosively popular mm -hmm. i hope it lasts forever but at the uh, right now you know we're we're in the middle of it we're we're cool just trying to keep up yeah, actually right. i can't you know and uh, this it thing i'm doing there's so much information it's just a tsunami i, I can't read it all it's i can't keep up with it overwhelming well, to bring it back to the passing of Dr. Kerr, it, uh, a lot of people thought it was the end of beekeeping, as we've talked about, but we've come to find out that it was only just another chapter yep. and a long book. So. Good way to put it. So thanks for inviting us down to your shop, uh, Jim. I, cl and I cleaned it up just for you, baby. It's it's fantastic. Yeah. We'll, we won't take any pictures. I would have taken pictures. No, but no pictures. <laughs> no pictures. <laughs> So, but it's nice and, and nice and cleaned up. So, uh, again, thanks for inviting us down and, and enjoying this afternoon with you. You're, you're always very welcome. Thank and if you. nothing else, I'll talk to you Friday on the webinar. That will be a good talk, right? Uh, yes, it We're will. We'll be talking about southern wintering and northern wintering. Yep, that's the topic. <clears throat> okay. Of course, you guys don't down there don't really have winter, so no, no, no. <laughs> nothing to worry about. It's either hot. <laughs> <laughs> has been hot or soon will be hot. Well, yep. <laughs> and one of these years you're going to have to do Pacific Northwest wintering because it's completely different. Yeah. That's a deal. It All right. Is. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Thank everybody. Well. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. That was a really good time in Ohio this last week, Kim. It was really great that uh, Dr. Two was able to get us into his house and invite us down with uh, the recording equipment and, uh, and set up in his studio and, and talk about the... Uh, the the legacy of Dr. Kerr and the Africanized bees. Yeah, it uh, it, it kind of came up kind of sudden uh, um, between the time we set up going down there and and going down there. So it kind of took all of us a little bit by surprise. But you know, the Africanized bee in the Western Hemisphere is directly descended from twenty six Tanzanian queen bees uh, that Dr. Kerr, Kerr got brought into Brazil and. They escaped in 1957, 61 years ago, and the world changed as far as we know it. Beekeeping has never been the same, probably yeah. never will be the same. Unlikely. It's been pretty crazy. It's been a wild ride. Uh, it's been a lot of bad press for honeybees, but has also brought valuable research dollars into uh, honeybees. And uh, it's also helped uh, bring some smart people into the honeybee research area, too. And, and it's, I think we've all benefited from it. Uh, Dr. Kerr uh, got a lot of bad press for the Africanized bees, but um, let's not forget all the good work he did. He did, and, and it was uh, good that we could be down there because Jim, too, was right in the middle of all of that for all of those years. Uh, he, he saw and was able to, to spread the good word, but also to warn and educate. So it was, we, we had the right guy at the right time this time. <laughs> Mark that down on the calendar. So we're going to have a lot. To, we're going to have a busy fall, Kim. Uh, we we got quite a few guests lined up. We just need to get them on the calendar. Yeah, uh, keep watching if you if you haven't already. Sign up to catch the buzz because we we're, we're going to have the schedule on there every once in a while. And once it's on catch the buzz, then you can go look at it on our webpage so you can say who's going to be here when and what they're going to be talking about. So. Uh, 
Catch the Buzz is a secret, www.bculture.com. And don't forget www.beekeepingtodaypodcast.com to go back and listen to what we've already done. That's right. And we'll also be announcing our uh, future guests on our Twitter feed, too. So uh, search for us at Beekeeping Today Podcast on Twitter, and you'll get the latest and updates there. Well, that about wraps it up, Kim. Yep, I think it does, Jeff. Thanks. It's been a fun week. Thanks so much for having me down there. Okay, good time. Take care. Bye-bye.